Arthur Hayes, who is a former BitMEX CEO, went on uh, the internet to write about his thoughts. And this is what he, he, he said. He said, I expect Bitcoin to experience a healthy 20% to 30% correction from whatever level has attained by early March. The washout could be even more severe if the slate of US listed spot Bitcoin ETFs has already commenced trading. Yeah, how would you respond to that? You know, there's no there's no rules when it comes to, to the world of crypto. I think it's the most nonsensical, irrational market that you could ever see. Um, but I think what we've seen over time is that it's started to uh, um, you know act and behave a lot more like a lot of other traditional markets. Obviously, quite volatile, but it's definitely subsided its volatility compared to you know however long you want to look at it. But in terms of um, you know what was said, I, I I do see that there could potentially be people looking to profit take, but at the same time, it's just very tough for me to see you know that that supply not. Being being easily absorbed by a lot of the people that are, you know, just now going to think about Bitcoin for the first time, given that we've traveled sideways for, you know, quite some time since the collapse of FTX. And then eventually, you know, we kind of started to rally up to the second half of 2023. Um, but I think that there's just a lot of players on the side that have been really excited for, you know, this news. And I think a lot of people are, you know, continuing to, 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 to buy the news as well. The much anticipated Bitcoin ETF is expected to not just change the crypto landscape, but the fabric of money itself and redefine money. What exactly does this mean? We'll be exploring this and the future of social media with our next guest, Solo Cize, who is the CEO of Galaxy, a brand new social media platform with a lot of features that you should know about. Solo, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful 2024, a great start to the year. I hope uh all is well to your platform. We're going to be talking about your platform and some of the major announcements. But first, let's talk about your views on what this Bitcoin ETF means for not just cryptocurrencies, but investing. I mean, one of the arguments that I've always heard is that people have always found a way to invest in Bitcoin already. If you were an institutional investor, you could have bought shares of a Bitcoin miner or or MicroStrategy, for example. If you were an individual retail investor, you could have just bought spot Bitcoin. How does the Bitcoin ETF actually change anything for investors? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, thank you for having me. I'm super excited to kick off 2024 with this news. I mean, I think, you know, one big part of it is really a legitimacy of the asset class. When you think about, you know, the re regulatory framework and what it's set out to do, um, providing, you know, clear guidelines on how we should act as players and within financial markets. Uh, one of the biggest things that's been difficult for Bitcoin is to be able to get that national recognition or that international recognition. Um, and so with the launch of this Bitcoin ETF, it's creating um, you know a lot more familiarity and a lot more bridging back to um, the traditional institutional players so that they can be a part of um, the world of Web3 and crypto, you know, as someone that's been in the space for a number of years now, it's quite easy for it to be sort of an echo chamber of groupthink. Um, but with the expansion of the, uh, you know, players that are interested in the space and, um, you know, the ETF itself, it really allows a lot of these asset managers and these big institutions to productize and sell Bitcoin um, and exposure to the asset class in a way they previously haven't um, without forcing a lot of those pain points when it comes to dealing with the asset class, like self-custody and those things, um, it just makes it a lot easier and turnkey for those people to get involved. Okay. And how does it change the um, idea of self-custody for crypto? Well, I think when you think about the ways in which you can get assets to, you know, a or get uh, exposure to the Bitcoin asset, it's just another avenue for in which, you know, play players can be able to go and, um, you know, buy that, a buy that exposure. And so previously, um, the idea of, you know, having to, you know, go to an exchange and go through KYC and, you know, to, just to go buy Bitcoin is a very different avenue that a lot of people may not have wanted to do. Whereas if they are able to go through their traditional avenues that the typical brokerage account where they can buy a spot ETF, that's very similar to all the different assets that they already trade. Um, it just makes that a lot more turnkey and a lot, and it makes Bitcoin a lot more like the other things that people invest. Um, you know, obviously it has a completely different risk profile. It's a completely different asset. There's so many different things about it that aren't different, but the way in which you go about investing it was a completely different endeavor, which, you know, is something that's going to be ameliorated greatly by having this ETF, which really helps bridge that gap from the world of, you know, digital assets and the power and promise of decentralization, but at the same time, um, using, you know, the institutional rails that we've had for quite some time to increase the liquidity and participation, uh, you know, within the market in a much more uh, familiar way. Okay. Ultimately, investors would like to know whether or not the news has already been baked into the price. Do you have any? Um, I know you're not a trader, but uh, can you share some insights as to whether or not you think that uh, uh, <laughs> expectations have already been built in? 
Uh, I mean, it's kind of tough, right? Because I think when you go down the street, I don't think we're quite at the levels of where, you know, people are talking about crypto, despite us, you know, sneakily rallying back up to the high 40s. You know, I think we're somewhere just underneath 47 at the time of this recording. But, um, you know, it's definitely uh, reinvigorated interest within the asset class. Um, but I also think, you know, just going back to what I just said, uh, you know, being able to productize and sell Bitcoin to a lot of people that have, you know, relatively, you know, stood out of the, you know, crypto and and uh, Web3 revolution to date just because they didn't really want to go down the path of self-custody. Um, and so being able to productize and sell exposure to that, obviously you could invest in Viners, you could do that. Um, but something like a spot ETF, um, you know, just really expands um, the access to liquidity, uh, you know, for those institutional players who have been looking for a product um, that allows them to really sell that exposure in a turnkey solution. So, you know, I think a lot of those inflows and you've been able to see it on, you know, Twitter and or X, it should be called now. A lot of people are, you know, speculating and seeing yeah. a lot of funds being sent to exchanges uh, in anticipation for what might happen on, uh, you know, the, on Wednesday the 10th when the deadline approaches us. So we'll see. But, you know, it's 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 tough in a in a short amount of time horizon. I think the only rule in crypto is that you can definitely be wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But I think over time, you know, the ETF is really going to invite a lot of inflows over the course of 2024. I think a lot of people are expecting, um, you know, lots and lots of inflows for those institutional players as they start to, um, you know, service that out to their clients and start to sell the product. Reading this um, article, um, Arthur Hayes, who is a former BitMEX CEO, went on uh, the internet to write about his thoughts. And this is what he 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 said. He said, I expect Bitcoin to experience a healthy 20% to 30% correction from whatever level has attained by early March. The washout could be even more severe if the slate of US listed spot Bitcoin ETFs has already commenced trading. So he's expecting uh you know exactly what I said: a price correction, sell the, yeah. sell the, buy the rumor, sell the news. Buy the kind rumor. Of a bet. Yeah. Um. Yeah. How would you respond to that? Uh, I mean, I think I, I don't, I don't think it would be, you know, I don't think it would. I th like I said, kind of. There's no, there's no rules when it comes to to the world of crypto. I think it's the most nonsensical, irrational market that you could ever see. Um. But I think what we've seen over time is that it started to. Uh, um, you know, act and behave a lot more like a lot of other traditional markets, obviously quite volatile, but it's definitely subsided its volatility compared to, you know, however long you want to look at it. But in terms of, um, you know, what was said, I, I I do see that there could potentially be people looking to profit take, but at the same time, it's just very tough for me to see, you know, that that supply not being easily absorbed by a lot of the people that are, you know, just now going to think about Bitcoin for the first time, given that we've traveled sideways for, you know, quite some time since the collapse of FTX. And then eventually, you know, we kind of started to rally up to the second half of 2023. Um, but I think that there's just a lot of players on the side that have been really excited for, you know, this news. And I think a lot of people are, you know, continuing to 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 buy the news as well. So I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know. If I 20% seems pretty, pretty, pretty steep to me, but there are no rules in this asset class. One thing that's been interesting is that the Bitcoin dominance uh, level has has been skyrocketing and Bitcoin dominance is just the level or percentage of Bitcoin's market cap relative to the overall crypto market cap. I'll put a chart on the screen to show the audience to illustrate the point. Uh, but Solo, do you think that Bitcoin's dominance having risen, do you think that uh, other altcoins and cryptos are more attractively valued, shall we put it that way, relative to Bitcoin right now? Well, you know, I think when you look at Bitcoin dominance, I think one of the things that, you know, when you start to see that to creep up as Bitcoin, um, you know, starts to gain, uh, you know, power relative to the others, it, it is a signal and indicator for, you know, the, the bull market, right? Like typically the altcoins tend to lag a little bit. And so yeah. you're, you are right. There are a lot of opportunities out there within the world of altcoins to pick up on some lower dollar priced coins that are expected to have a lot more convexity to the upside as Bitcoin goes up. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think uh, even on top of that, I think when you do look at altcoins as a whole, um, you know, not all coins are created equal and it's quite important to do your own research, but also look at the projects and who's using the actual technology, right? A lot of times in our ecosystem and space, there's a lot of, you know, community can drive a lot of the value, which is very important um, to having sufficient, sufficient and efficient markets, sufficient liquidity and all those things. Um, but at the same time, it's very important to really understand who's leveraging this technology, asking yourself, does this coin and its infrastructure really need to exist in the world that we have? Or is there something like it? Or is it the something that's hot this week? Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, when you start to see Bitcoin dominance creep up, it is an indicator for things to come and altcoins tend to lag. Um, so there's definitely a lot of extra value you could scoop up down there if you're able to really take a, a pointed look at it. 
Uh, so let's pivot to social media. Tell us about some use cases of uh, Bitcoin and crypto overall that can be applied to today's evolving social media landscape. In other words, can we see real life applications of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular um, in the Web3 world, in social media, so on and so forth? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think in spirit of, you know, the ETF news, I, again, you know, being able to look at Bitcoin as a store of value is amazing. But, um, you know, what's also great about the Web3 revolution is all the nice consumer facing dApps that have, uh, you know, popped up over the last couple of years through the bear market. And so I'm a proud uh, founder and CEO of Galaxy in partnership with Spencer Dinwiddie of the Brooklyn Nets. Um, we are we have built a social finance platform on top of Hedera Hashgraph. Um, but essentially what we allow, uh, you know, we allow our users to do is um, essentially we've built a non-custodial wallet that makes it very easy for people to actually do things with Web3 technology. If you think about operating and using a wallet today, um, the user experience and standard at the time that Satoshi invented uh, Bitcoin, things like PayPal already exist, which had a much better streamlined user experience for actually disseminating or using the technology and exchanging a value. And so one of the things that Galaxy has done um, over the last couple of years is try to refine that experience. And so we most recently uh, have been able to release a new feature that allows users to easily send crypto, NFTs, and any type of digital asset as easy as a text message uh, within the messaging chat system within the Galaxy application. But um, over time, we've also been known for the marketplace tooling we've built that allows um, various influencers and creators to sell experiences in that marketplace and get paid directly to that wallet. Um, and so back to what I mentioned before, you know, the, the consumer dApps and really gamifying the wallet and making the wallet something that is critical to the average day uh, person's life in real world utility is something that we've been focused on quite, quite specifically. Okay. Can you just back up and uh, tell us what Galaxy exactly is? How does, how does it work just on a basic level? Galaxy is a social finance application, um, similar to a Twitter or an X. You have a home feed, you have a discover page, you have your messaging system, um, but it's a Web3 social ecosystem. So you have your own non-custodial wallet as well um, and profiles. And so within this ecosystem, we call it the social wallet. Um, Galaxy is the first crypto wallet that has a very familiar look and feel to it, um, to the world of Web2. And so within that paradigm, you can very easily you know, interact with your timeline, your feed, you can repost content, you can send content back and forth to your um, friends. You can also go to navigate to play, uh, people's profiles or content creators. Um, they're able to set up their own storefronts. They can sell digital experiences, things like video calls, video messages, exclusive content, um, and they get paid directly to the non-custodial wallet that's linked to their account within the Galaxy ecosystem. Um, but we've also built a lot of those features within the application that leverage that wallet so that people that have crypto you now can do something with it, right? So if you got $25 of Bitcoin, um, you could actually use it in the similar fashion to like a Venmo or a Zelle as a way to reconcile, you know, a social finance transaction. If I were to ask you, David, um, you know, you like crypto, Crypto, but when was the last time you used Bitcoin to pay a friend back for pizza? You probably wouldn't have told me that anytime soon. Well, with Galaxy, um, that's now made possible through that familiar social finance experience that we've grown accustomed to in the world of Web2. But just from a user experience perspective, how is this different from me transferring my Bitcoin on a on a on a cold wallet or a hot wallet online? Or, 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 or even just uh, or, or an exchange to another person's wallet. I mean, it took a long time for you to explain to me what you were going to do. And I think that's kind of the point. <laughs> okay, right? fair enough. Like, I don't think your grandmother could do that quite easily. I've built a product that's made it easy so that a five-year-old could do it. That's why. Um, we were strong believers in this social wallet push and refining the way in which we look at non-custodial wallets. I don't think that, you know, Satoshi, when, and we don't think, actually as a team, we don't think that when Satoshi invented this technology that it was meant to be this arduous to use. Um, it was in its prototypical stage. Um, and we believe that non-custodial wallets should be able to call your friend. They should be able to make you money. They should be able to be used and easy to use, like, um, you know, sending a text message. It shouldn't be this arduous process that we use. And we believe that these features um, that we've built around the wallet is what makes the average person come back to this wallet versus is, you know, building a, you know, a new paradigm that people are going to have to go through a ton of rigidity to yeah. get used to. And how is the Bitcoin custodied? 
Uh, well, it's a it's a it's a non-custodial wallet. So it's a general wallet. They have their own seed phrase or anything like that. But it's really the oh, okay. idea of being able to move the assets on chain. Um, and so instead I of see. having to ask you, David, what's your public key so I can send you this Bitcoin, and you're gonna be like, oh, my public key is X. I send you a text transaction. It takes an hour, and then you're like, oh, I got it. And then I'm just going to send you the rest of it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the money's gone if I mess it up. Instead of that, I should be able to navigate to your profile, click the message icon, tap the little like the tap the lightning bolt on the corner, crypt, how much crypto I want to send to you, and send it as a text. It should be no more difficult than that. Do you have stable coins as well on your platform? Uh, yeah. So right now we're live on the Hedera network, so you can support any type of HTS asset or uh, HTS NFT. That so that could be anything. It could be a, a coin on the Hedera network, or uh, you know HUSDC uh, or USDC built on the Hedera network. But we are looking to add cross chain support right now as well, and so people are going to be able to enjoy the same benefits um, that they do with their Hedera assets with other assets as well on chain. So we want to be a non custodial wallet that has those cross chain capabilities um, to really be that public square where people interact with and use digital assets in a way they've never before. I'm curious on your platform, which, uh, which coins uh, or coin has been the most popular for transactions? Uh, I mean, it would have to be HBAR. Okay. <laughs> HBAR is definitely uh, the most popular one. But, um, you know, we have a lot of coins in there. A lot of NFT projects have, uh, you know, came out and, to, uh, came out and brought their, their, their assets with them and their communities with them. And so um, it's been quite exciting in the early days to see how people have been using the platform. But the greatest part about being an early builder is reacting to that market feedback and understanding what, um, you know, people are really looking for and what they're excited about. So I've talked to payments processors like coin payments is just one example. And in the early days of cryptos being used as a uh, payment um, currency, if you want to call it that, Bitcoin was the dominant one in its early days. And then slowly, uh, stable coins took over. And now I believe on most payment platforms, stable coins are like 80% of peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And that's mostly due to the fact that uh, peers prefer a coin that is less volatile, right? If you're if you're a pro, if you're a payments uh, a vendor or if you're a merchant, you, you don't really want to be using something that's super volatile for your day to day payments. But as Bitcoin matures, solo, do you think that this volatility will come down, and thus the popularity of Bitcoin as a as a as a medium of exchange will return? Yeah, I mean, I think when you just look at the history of trade and, and commerce over time is, you know, eventually you'll get to a point where we'll see a completely debasement from, you know, us thinking about Bitcoin relative to dollars, right? A lot of people will remind you quickly in this space that one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, and that is always the case. Um, you know, it doesn't always equal however many dollars it might be trading at on the spot, right? Um, but eventually over time, you know, you're going to move to a society where we start to value things in rel in terms relative to Bitcoin, um, you know, over a time, long enough time horizon. Obviously, you know, that between now and X time could be 25 years or whatever yeah. that might be. But just as you go down that process, exactly what you mentioned, you'll start to see that volatility start to matter less in the way in which people transact and interact with the asset. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, obviously, as you know, we get into the early days of it and you start to, you know, get to, you know, those the, that idea of the super cycle, which we, you know, potentially could see where a lot of institutional capital comes in and we see, a, you know, a huge spike in pricing. Um, you know, in the next couple of years, um, you know, you'll start to see people really wanting to keep that Bitcoin, which is really going to, you know, add to that that up to upward pressure, um, you know, given the scarcity of the asset. And so, um, you know, absolutely, I think over time, you'll start to see people value and transact in Bitcoin. You use the word super cycle. Can you expand on that? What, what did you mean by that? Uh, super cycle. So I think when you think about the concept of the Bitcoin ETF and what it really allows a lot of these institutional players to to do, really, when you think about it, the the mandates for a lot of these people is that until there was a uh, financial instrument that made it really easy for these people to buy um, Bitcoin, they were you know largely not. And I know that as you know someone that's looked to raise money from a lot of these institutional guys, um, you know a lot of the internal processes for um, custodying the digital assets haven't quite been figured out until you know just now recently. Um, but I think the ETF does a, a long uh, does a does a big it does a lot of work and takes us a long way in towards um, institutional players being able to market that out to their um, their clients and be able to productize and sell that, which is going to bring in even more capital than we previously could have envisioned. Prior to that, this cycle, we've never had that type of 
um, you know, asset or inward, you know, uh, pressure to the asset class, right? And so I think that legitimacy and that maturity of the asset could actually bring us inflows that we've never seen before, because for the longest time, this space has largely been um, uninhabited by the institutional guy in any sort of meaningful way. We're talking about an asset class that's, you know, smaller than Apple <laughs> as a whole, basically. <laughs> mm, interesting. Looking ahead now, are there any other developments or new applications built on top of layer ones that you think will be exciting? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the the biggest thing that we're going to see, I think, is the real world utility and like real world asset tokenization or RWAs is really big. And that's something that's been uh, pretty big in the ecosystem that Galaxy has been a part of and the broader dairy ecosystem. But, um, you know, just really starting people to look at tokenizing things like real estate, uh, carbon credits and all of those things. Those are going to be interesting use cases, especially on the enterprise side that you start to see, um, you know, in the early days. I think what's been quite interesting is despite that, you know, there's been an exodus of a lot of players from the space, there have been um, some institutions that have been quite bullish on the technology and still looking to build and um, explore new ways to, to use blockchain solutions to enhance their businesses. Um, so I'm really excited about those. But also, you know, just like with anything in crypto, um, the unknown is what makes it super exciting. And so I can't wait until we see, uh, you know, what we don't know of yet. Last time we had NFTs, which came out of virtually nowhere, and that was just a crazy phenomenon. And so it'll be very exciting to see what kind of other, you know, decentralized centralized finance or social finance applications, kind of like the ones that we're building at Galaxy, um, might uh, pop up in the next cycle that we have here. Finally, I want to learn a little bit about you and your entrepreneurial journey. So you have an interesting background. Well, you have a pretty traditional finance background, I would say, Wharton grad, then you worked in banking, I think Goldman for a month, and then uh, Citigroup, you were there for a couple of years, right? Uh, doing uh, corporate finance, and then you worked at MasterCard, I believe. How did you transition into the space you're in now, which is to, well, before even you started your own business, I think you were involved in crypto. Am, am I correct? Yeah. So, I mean, we've done a lot of different things over the years, but I've yeah. uh, I've done a lot of different things over the years, but our story is quite interesting. But um, yeah, I had that traditional finance background and I actually had the pleasure of being able to quit my job one day and team up with my good friend, Spence. Uh, he actually been one of the, he was actually the first NBA player to tokenize himself. Uh, and so wow. when I was at City, I focused on securitized products uh, and I also helped Spencer tokenize himself through that contract securitization. And that's what really kicked off our digital assets journey because um, he minted those on Ethereum blockchain. And that was kind of our proof of concept of, you know, this technology could really help. You know, I guess that was like the first RWA, if you could think of it. I'm just curious, was that <laughs> was that existed. was that minting process difficult for you at all, given that you had a econ and finance background and not so much a computer science background? Uh, well, you just staff your team accordingly, right? Like okay. I, I would still not even call myself a crypto guy as much as I talk right. about it on the internet, right? Like I'm, yeah. I'm a hard, I'm a hardcore finance guy. That's just how I see the world, uh, as I'm sure you can respect. But, uh, you know, we had a really great team of us, uh, you know, of individuals around us that ended up becoming the Galaxy team as well. And um, you just saw a bigger opportunity to tokenize, you know, the world and the creator economy outside of just, you know, pro sports contracts and things like that. And so that's what gave birth to um, Galaxy as we know it as that creator marketplace. I'm just curious, how has the NBA adopted cryptocurrencies and NFTs? And then, you know, how, how is basically Bitcoin and the NBA and the professional sports realms kind of married? Yeah, I mean, Spencer fell on a big sword back in the day. Like he was talking about crypto back when it was still like, you know, like... <laughs> why do you know about why do you know about this stuff, dude? Um, but yeah, he uh, he fell on a fair, fair amount of swords. Um, but you can see a quite a quite a, a lot of embracement from sports leagues all over the world, not just crypto uh, and just not the NBA. Right. And so um, you saw the rise of things like NBA Top Shot, which changed the way we think about NFTs as a whole, pioneering the space. And, uh, you know, even myself, I'm also involved with uh, Karate Combat, which is the first, you know, sports league that's been able to tokenize themselves entirely, um, you know, through a dat like system. And they have their fans voting on fighter matchups in this combat sports league, really utilizing blockchain technology and distributed, distributed ledger technology. And so, um, you know, super excited for all the different use cases. Very cool. All right. Solo. Excellent stuff. Thanks very much for your updates. Where can we learn more about you and your uh, and your app, Galaxy? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can learn about me, uh, you know, on Twitter. Uh, you find me at Solo Cise, S O L O C E E S A Y. You can find me at Solo Cise on Instagram, um, LinkedIn, and all the other things I write as well. So you can follow me on some of my 
post on Rolling Stone and Entrepreneur. But obviously, uh, you know, as always, thank you for having me on the show, David. It's a pleasure. Um, and if you want to learn more about Galaxy, just keep up on our blog.galaxy.com or galaxy.com, the website. Yeah, it's my my pleasure as well. Happy uh, start to the new year again, and uh, good luck to uh, all your new endeavors this year. Thank you, you too. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to follow CZ in the link down below. Subscribe and like this video.